Uh, hello. Uh, uh, welcome to this installment of our AG Webinars Professional Development Series featuring Ashley Smith from American Journal Experts. I'm Nathaniel Janik, Career Services Coordinator at AGU, and I'll be your host for today's webinar titled Creating Figures for Scientific Posters. Uh, a few things to go over before we begin. If you have any questions at any time during the presentation today, please feel free to type them into the question box on the right side control panel, and we will answer as many as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, under the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel, you will also find a copy of today's slides, which you can download at any time during the presentation. And finally, the link to the online recording of this webinar will be sent to all webinar attendees in a follow-up email in a few days. Uh, once again, presenting today's webinar is Ashley Smith from American Journal Experts. Uh, American Journal Experts offers services for scientific publications and presentations, including abstract editing, translation services, poster and figure design, as well as many others. Uh, today, Ashley will be discussing how to effectively create figures for your poster presentation. Um, but before I pass the presentation over to her, I'd like to start with our first poll. And uh, the first poll question is, uh, where will you be presenting your work? Uh, so the options are uh, fall meeting 2017, the fall 2017 virtual poster showcase, uh, Ocean Sciences Meeting 2018, uh, a publication, or uh, lastly, not presenting yet, just here to learn. Uh, so I'm going to leave this open uh, for a few more moments and close it in three, two, one. And uh, so we've got the results here. It looks like 32% uh, of our attendees are presenting their work in a publication. 32% uh, are also going to be presenting at fall meeting. 11% uh, uh, will be at the Ocean Sciences meeting 2018. And uh, one in four of the respondents said they're not presenting yet. They're just here to learn. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to you, Ashley. Great. Can you guys see everything okay? Yeah, it uh, looks good. Oh, perfect. Um, so thank you so much, Nathaniel, for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be here today to help everybody out. Um, as Nathaniel mentioned, my name is Ashley Smith. And I work in the illustration department at AJE, where my job entails taking rough drafts of figures and posters and improving their clarity and aesthetics, as well as making them fit the guidelines of either the author's chosen journal or of the conference of choice. Uh, my team helped me put together this presentation today in which we share some tips and tricks for creating presentation ready figures. So what are the powers of figures? Figures are becoming increasingly important in the academic publishing arena as open access publishing becomes more common and there are fewer limitations on the number of figures that you can have as well as uh, color costs beginning to disappear. Within the last several years, PubMed and journal websites have begun to display thumbnails of figures alongside abstracts for all of their index publications, which means that from the initial search for your paper, your figures are already making an impression. This is even more important than ever that the first impression, which most often occurs in poster format, is a good one because unclear or unpolished graphics can often tarnish a viewer's opinion of your work and often leads them to think that the science may not be entirely sound. So I like to say that figure quality is a poster suit and tie. Your figures reflect your overall effort in experimental design, technical execution, and attention to detail. When people view a poster, such as uh, OSPA judges, for example, they expect the poster to look nice. And of course, ugly figures will not lead to a pretty poster. 
any poorly executed methods such as fuzzy gels or high background on fluorescent images or Western blots, et cetera. And any poorly assembled figures can kind of create a negative impression in the reviewer's mind, perhaps leading them to be a little less trusting or a little more nitpicky in their review. Second, an expression which many of you, if not all of you, have heard before is, a picture is worth a thousand words. Open a copy of Nature, Science, or Cell and try to find a poorly executed method or poorly assembled figure. You really won't be able to, and there's a reason for that. A well-executed figure can take less text to explain clearly than a poorly thought out one. This is something important to remember in poster creation, since the more you can explain through your figures, the less text is necessary. So today I'm going to go over with you how to create figures that will not only benefit your poster, but also help in future publications as well. Primary data figures, where to start? So without question, the creation of beautiful figures, particularly those involving images, starts at the bench. It's important that you master the techniques required to capture, for example, high quality fluorescence images or cell morphology images, and that you make careful note of the magnifications and settings, both on the equipment and any adjustments made post capture, because any adjustments to contrast, brightness, or gamma should be reported in your methods and in fact applied exactly the same way to every set of images. Like photography, it takes practice. However, the higher the quality of your original image, the higher the quality of your final figure. Next, it's extremely important to consider the format in which you are saving your image. An image file can be saved as some sort of pixel-based file type. So pixel-based graphics are often called roster or bitmap, bitmap graphics are comprised of individual bits or pixels, as their name suggests, that when combined make up the entire image. Pixel-based file types can be separated into two main categories, lossy and lossless. And I'm going to stop for a brief moment um, for our second poll today. Yeah, uh, thanks. So uh, the second poll is, and uh, it's a little bit less of a poll and more of a quick quiz here to gather where the audience is as far as your, your knowledge of these sorts of things. Which of these formats is considered to be a lossy file format? So your options are TIFF, PDF, JPEG, or LZW. And I'm going to be closing it in uh, three, two, one. And uh, it looks like uh, we've got 18% for TIFF, 21% for PDF, 14% for LVW, but the better portion of you, 46% answered JPEG, which is, uh, I would say, mostly the, uh, the best answer. All right, I'm going to pass it back to you there, Ashley. Great. Um, so really glad that we did that poll. Um, so today is actually going to be pretty eye-opening for a lot of you JPEG users um, because you're going to learn that that is not actually the best way um, to save your image files. And uh, as we continue here, you'll learn why that is. Um, so let me see. So again, speaking to the lossy and lossless file formats, the most common example of a lossy format is the JPEG, which I can see much of you are used to using. Um, saving in this format essentially divides your image into tiles. And the number of colors in each of those tiles is simplified each time the file is saved. Therefore, the degree of simplification of the JPEG file depends on the quality setting that you choose when saving the file. So for instance, when you're saving the file, you'll see some sort of dialog box that has just popped up on your screen here. And it is this slider portion that determines the simplification of colors in the individual tiles within your image. And therefore, that final image quality 
um, is determined by the slider. It's important to remember, though, that this process occurs anew each time the file is opened, um, perhaps edited or modified in some way, or perhaps emailed to somebody and then they download it and then they resave it. Anytime this file is resaved, this JPEG file, it leads to attrition of data from this file over time. So this can lead to the file becoming more pixelated and increasingly blurry over time or over each successive saving of it. And obviously, that is not something we're looking for, the loss of, uh, of file quality over time. Um, so I guess the question remains, why does a JPEG format exist? Well, it's a wonderful format for creating compact files for applications where high fidelity is not necessarily critical. Things like family photos, for instance. But the compression applied to a JPEG format is irreversible. So you can see why it'd be a big deal and a big mistake to save your original files this way. Um, imagine what this would mean for something like a Western blot that you hope to quantitate with densitometry. Depending on the quality setting, you can massively skew your results and your measurements because the numbers you would get off your densitometry would depend on the compression that was used and the position of the bands relative to the 8x8 tiles found within the JPEG. Um, I understand this is slightly confusing, but basically what that all means is that you're, you have no way to stop the loss of quality of a JPEG over time. So you may take this brilliant picture that you'd like to use for publication, but after sending it to several reviewers or sending it to several people in your lab and resaving it and getting it sent back, that, that file is eventually going to start to look blurry and you're really going to lose that original quality that you once had. So I have an example here for you. Uh, in this example, you can see that with each successive compression, we lose more and more data. It's important to note that the actual pixel density here doesn't change. So the resolution does not read any differently when you view it. Only the color of the pixels have changed uh, during compression. However, in the end, you still end up with a much poorer pixelated looking image. So next, I'd like to talk about the lossless files. The most common alternative to a lossy format, like the JPEG, is the TIFF format. Saving your original images as TIFFs will ensure that the color of each pixel is recorded and will not change as a result of simply resaving the file. The downside of this file is size. You can see here that saving the image as a TIFF as a opposed to a JPEG results in a file that is many times larger. So if you're taking hundreds or thousands of images as part of your research, it may be wise to invest in an external memory or cloud-based repository for your images, or they can start to take up huge amounts of space on your hard drive. Again, just a final comparison of uh, lossy versus lossless formats. Um, the problem of compression becomes even more apparent when you have text or line art in your figure because with low quality settings or subsequent savings, some gray pixels begin to appear at the interface of the high contrast areas, such, uh, such in this case as the text you can see. You can see that around the JPG, you can see pixelation, which you can't see um, in the corresponding TIFF image. This is why most journals require that line art or text heavy images be submitted at a very high resolution, usually around 1000 to 1200 DPI or higher. Um, in fact, the best way to save line art files would be as a PDF or EPS file types. And we'll get more into this later on in the presentation. So as I was mentioning before, one of the downsides is of uh, TIFF files or lossless file types is the fact that when you save them, they save at a relatively high storage. However, there is something we can do to combat this, and um, this is LZW compression. And it's the most efficient way to compress uh, a file of lossless file type. Um, so unlike uncompressed 
compressed TIFF files, LZW compressed TIFF files have no loss of information and have much more efficient storage. So for instance, LZW lossless file compression can be very effective on images with large number of colors. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of this because it is important to remember that even though it might seem like an image, such as this image, doesn't contain very many colors, to the computer, two subtly different shades of red are as different as black is from white. You can see here that the uncompressed TIFF saved at 2,710 kilobytes, while the LZW compressed TIFF saved at only 1,550 kbs. LZW lossless file compression becomes even more powerful on images with a limited number of colors. So in this example, the uncompressed TIFF saved at 25,200 kilobytes. That's 25.2 megabytes. This is a huge file. Not only is it huge just to store on your computers, but it's a huge file, especially for posters that will already have a larger file size and it will make any poster or any um, manuscript harder to email to colleagues for review, harder to upload for conference approval, or, or harder to email to even print. However, an LZW compressed TIFF saved at only 256 kilobytes, and even a JPEG with a high quality setting saved higher than that at 586 kilobytes. The difference between the compressed and uncompressed TIFF files is almost a hundredfold. So now that we've talked about your starting materials and kind of the basics to the beginning of your figures, let's, let's talk about how to properly assemble a good figure. My colleagues and I have come up with two simple rules for the creation of publication ready figures. First, don't neglect the journal or events guidelines. Make sure that you're reading through the preferred specifications for your figures to avoid desk rejection based on simple things that you can easily change. Usually you'll find preferences for file type and resolution, sometimes preferences for color space and poster width and occasionally preferences for font size and type, as well as line weights. Also, keep a sense of scale. Many times when you're working on your computer screen with all the zooming in and out, your sense of scale for the figure can get distorted. One great way of checking your scale is to print out your figure so you can physically visualize how it will appear on a published page or how large it will appear on your poster. Uh, AJU suggests that Paragraphs and figure captions be 24 point font or 0.9 centimeters in height, that headers be at least 36 point font, and that you be creative by using different font sizes, styles, and colors. Speaking to the latter guideline, it is indeed important to display creativity in your posters so that it, so that it draws people towards it. However, I want you to remember that some font styles and colors can be distracting and actually draw attention away from your actual research. So for instance, bright colors are difficult to read and colors such as yellow don't print very well. The poster must be creative, yet still readable and legible. The second figure creation rule that should be followed is to keep things simple. Avoid putting too much text or too many figures in the poster. You don't have to add your entire lab notebook. You want to give people the general idea of your research and you want to convey the most important findings in a concise manner so interest isn't lost. Provide them enough information so that they're interested and engaged with you, but not so much that they have to sit by your poster for 15 minutes to read it because most likely they'll just move on. One way of ensuring this is by keeping font size above 24 above 24 points. This successfully inhibits the amount you can actually fit within your poster. Uh, 
Another issue that authors sometimes have some confusion or uncertainty about is the type of graphic they should use to report their data. Well, depending on what you wish to communicate, there are several different standard visuals to choose from. So for instance, you may use a bar graph, a scatter plot, a pie chart, line graphs, or data tables to report your data if you're comparing one set of values with another. But a different set of options may be more appropriate if you want to show, let's say, the distribution of a set of values. That is, to understand the outliers or the normal ranges, etc. Or if you want to show how various parts comprise the whole, or understand a trend over time of some variable or variables, or to see which values de deviate from the norm or how a group of values relates to one another. These all require different graphical representations. Another thing I want to stress is labeling your figures and labeling your primary data. It's a, probably a good idea to make the legend something that's more supplementary. What I mean by this is incorporate enough information in the image and the figure itself that a person can grasp the basic understanding from the figure and save the other more supplemental material for the legend. This is particularly crucial in poster creation where you want to keep text concise. Uh, next, let's change our focus once again to talk about creating clear and effective graphs. So often researchers will use a completed figure as a completed figure, the output of graphing software like Excel. But the process of creating a clear and aesthetically pleasing graph need not and indeed should not stop with the default output. This graph will almost certainly not meet the guidelines of your target journal for future publication and will definitely not present itself well in a poster format. Often default setting text is too small, there are superfluous grid lines, tick marks, and labels unnecessary titles and legends, as well as unnecessary colors and shading that do not look good, especially on a printed page. So um, this is a graph that I created in Excel, and you can see that while still within Excel, just with a little bit of adjustment, you can really see a, a clear difference and send a clearer message by removing those extraneous things from your graph. The link below, which you can refer to in your handout, is a very useful website describing helpful hints and tips for proper graph preparation. In addition, it can be helpful at times to simplify your figure legends by using color and or directly labeling each line. Another default setting that some programs have is the use of patterns. Many journals specifically indicate that they will not accept graphs that use patterns to distinguish groups. And avoidance of patterns should also extend to your poster creation. In fact, if biology has taught us anything, it's that patterns are designed to obscure, not to reveal. So don't obscure your data. Instead, use shades of gray that are at least 20% divergent, or use color if you have a large number of categories. Another consideration is the orientation of your graph. Really think about how you can show data to make it easiest for the reader. In this case, just by switching the orientation of this graph, I have made it easier for the reader to read the text on the axes. So I'll, I'll stop here for our poll number three before we continue. All right, thank you, Ashley. Uh, and the uh, final question that we have here is, which of these programs have you used to create figures? Uh, please select one. R, uh, CorelDRAW, Inkspace, Adobe Illustrator, or I've never created a figure. And if I, uh, if your choice is not one of those on there, feel free to type it in the question box and, uh, and I'll read off some of those as well. Uh, I'm going to close in three, two, one, and closing. And it looks like uh, 
It's got an 8% each of used Corel Draw and Inkspace. Uh, 23% has never created a figure. Uh, looks like a whole a whole lot of people have used all of the above. Uh, we've got Mathematica and MATLAB, uh, PowerPoint, Excel, Plotly, Python. Um, out of the options that we had here, uh, which of the programs have you used? 31% uh, said R, and another 31% said Adobe Illustrator. Uh, so there you have that. Great. So I'm glad to see a lot of people using Adobe Illustrator. That's a great secondary program for creating figures, um, and it's highly recommended. Um, basically, I, I like seeing the results of that poll because it's important to realize that figure creation doesn't have to stop at the primary program. So for R, in R, for instance, you can create a, a pretty good looking figure, but you can also then export that figure and bring it into a secondary program, which I will, will talk about in a second, and make that figure even better. Um, so I will continue. Now that we, we know what a good graph should encompass, let's talk about moving those graphs between programs and potentially into a program where you can enhance your figure even further. Any graphing program that you use uh, to create a graph creates graph as vectors or editable objects. This means that unlike an image or other pixel-based formats, each line, text, and object can be directly edited and transformed. In addition, editable file formats have almost limitless resolution, which means that their size can be increased without showing any signs of pixelation. This is especially important with posters where figures often have to be enlarged. So if you want to do some cleanup work on your graph in a graphics program, you can usually either copy and paste your graph directly into that program, or in the case of programs such as R or Coral Draw, you can save or export that file as a PDF or EPS file. Both of these are vector file formats. And then you can reopen those vector formats using your vector drawing program of choice and basically go to town. One thing I do want to remind you, however, is that it's important to remember once a file is saved as an image or any in image based file type, such as um, PNG, JPEG, TIFF, etc., it will never be editable again, even if you then resave that TIFF file as a PDF or EPS file. In order to maintain an editable format, you must export the original graph or diagram, etc., from the program of creation as a PDF or EPS file. So as promised, there are several um, different programs you can use for secondary editing of your figures. Here at AJE, we prefer to use Adobe Illustrator. Uh, however, that is a purchase software. Um, other purchase softwares include Coral Draw um, and Microsoft Expression Design. However, there is also some free software available online, such as Dia and Inkscape. Um, so once you've created your graph, you can save it, again, as a vector file type, which is preferable for poster creation. Uh, or you can save your file as a pixel-based file type. Just make sure you save it at the appropriate resolution. And you can bring it into these secondary software editing programs uh, to make to enhance your figure even further. Again, I'll repeat to you that uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and this is even a case with illustrative diagrams. So, for instance, this is a diagram from one of my colleagues' papers that was panel A of a multi-part figure in a paper. It happens to illustrate an extremely complicated assay but does it in a very clear and effective manner. So diagrams such as this can really help reduce reader confusion, especially in a poster when you're, you're limited in text. In fact, when your diagram is so beautiful and so clearly depicted, it could ultimately be used to promote not only yourself, your lab, but also your new, new manuscript. It can be used maybe as a cover image in, in potential publications, 
Uh, again, it can be used as your poster to really um, reduce the need for text. Uh, I, I really can't say enough about illustrated diagrams. If you can use them, use them when you can. Next, I wanted to go uh, into a bit more detail about saving your figures, as this can be considered one of the most important steps in the figure formatting process. After spending so much time creating the perfect figure, you want to ensure that the highest quality, that you use the highest quality you can in your poster. As I previously mentioned, there are two formats for saving your figures. The best format to save image-based figures is the previously mentioned pixel-based method. LWZ compressed TIFF files are the industry, industry standard. Remember, these are uneditable files with a set resolution that cannot be increased once saved. So please ensure that you, you are using the correct size and resolution when saving these figures. The general rule of thumb is a resolution of 300 DPI for any photo only figures, a resolution of 600 DPI with figures that contain both photos and text or line art, and 1,200 DPI for all figures containing graphs, diagrams, or other line art. Remember, when saving files for a poster that you will want to save the figure not only at the resolution of interest, but also at the size you want it to be displayed on your poster. Even an image saved at a high resolution of 1,200 DPI can become pixelated if the, sides need, if the size needs to be greatly enlarged after saving. So it is best to try to save the images at the estimated final size. Finally, the best way to save line art, such as graphs, is via a vector-based method. The industry standard for vector-based figures are EPS and PDF files. These files are editable, do not lose information over successive savings, and have practically infinite resolution. However, I will reiterate my earlier point that it is important to remember that once a graph, or any file for that matter, is saved as a pixel-based file, that pixel-based file can never be resaved as a vector-based or editable file. In order to yield an editable file, it must be saved as an EPS or PDF directly from the program, the graph, or line art was created in. Finally, uh, I'd like to talk to you about making an impact with color. I feel like this is often a forgotten topic or um, kind of a misunderstood topic in figure creation. So I hope to clarify it a little bit for you. We, get, we actually get a lot of questions here at AJE about the best way, what the best way is to use color in a figure. Um, so I have an example here for you of what we would consider uh, effective use, where you have two sets of data, each associated with five values, oh, that's a little bit out of, represented by A through E, which may be different drugs or different physical demographic categories, what have you. As I mentioned before, this is one way of showing parts of a whole. The advantage of using a color key as opposed to directly labeling these categories is that it allows you to more easily compare like categories between two sets. Uh, so I apologize, it looks like my orders got mixed up here. But here is the second example and you can see that this is an example of superfluous or unnecessary use of color. We also see this quite often, either with colors or patterns. And rather than enhancing the figure, what this ends up doing is masking the message and creating confusion. So instead, if you, have, if you only have one set of data, it's best to keep it simple with one color and individually label the columns. So the important thing about color is that you want to use color to highlight and to emphasize your data or to separate and define your data, your data. And you want it to, to use it to associate related information. You do not want to use color to compete with relevant data. You don't want to use it in a way that 
then becomes distracting to the reader. And you definitely don't want to use color just for the sake of using color. Another often overlooked topic when we're talking about color is color blindness. Somewhere around 15% of the human population has some form of color deficiency, with the most common forms being types of red and green. In this example, you can see that the control and treatment groups are distinguished using red and green. However, people afflicted with certain color deficiencies would see the image as essentially one monotone color as depicted on the right. So this is something you really want to be careful of, not, not only with your posters, but with any sort of manuscript, uh, manuscript publication, is you, you want to be aware um, of what colors you're using, make sure they're colorblind safe. We actually here at AJE have an array of um, color palettes that are color deficiency safe, because you want, to be, you want everybody to be able to understand your data. Um, and it's easy to do that just by, in, in this case, switching the colors instead of red and green to maybe red and blue. Um, so again, colors, colors can be often overlooked but quite important in both publication and poster processes. So uh, hopefully today I was able to shed some light on the figure formatting process um, and poster creation process. I'm more than happy to answer uh, any questions now and um, I'm not, I think, um, yeah. I'm yeah, uh, so. thanks. Um, yeah, if you don't mind uh, just leaving that slide up, uh, the, just the question slide, that way anybody that wants to grab your info, uh, so, yeah, I think it's the last slide. Um, uh, but while I wait to see if there are additional questions, I, I'll start off with uh, some of the ones that have already come in. Um, firstly, somebody just wanted to comment that uh, that they had Inkscape on their system, but did not know what it was for until today. Um, the uh, so the, the first question that I have uh, is, what fonts are used most for posters? So um, when we do poster, I'm sorry that my slide keeps going down. Uh, I'll when we up, uh, I'll still still fine. It's fine. Oh, okay. So when we format posters here at AG and the fonts that we find not only most often, but we find most um, legible is uh, Arial and Times New Roman. Generally, um, generally like to keep font consistent on the, on the poster, but sometimes you'll see the font for, let's say, your introduction and all your text segments be Times New Roman and the font within your figures to be Arial. Uh, this is something that actually mirrors what they ask for publication. Most often for publication purposes, you'll find that the text within your manuscript will be Times New Roman, but the text within the figures is required to be Arial. Um, so we kind of stick with that uh, publication industry standard for posters as well. Okay. Um so uh, the next one I have, uh, is there any reason to choose EPS over PDF? Um, I actually have gone back and forth, uh, mostly because when I'm formatting for journals, journals actually um, sometimes require an EPS over a PDF. I personally um, don't really know of any huge difference. Um, it's set for the fact that not everybody can open an EPS file. EPS files can only be opened within specific programs, such as Adobe Illustrator. Many people do not have uh, Adobe Illustrator. It's, a, it's quite an, an expensive program. So um, here at AJE, unless it is required um, from a journal or for instance, we always try to format as a PDF just because it's more um, universal for everybody um, to open and to access than the EPS is. But both of them are both editable files, both yield ve vector-based images. Um, so I would say that, um, that they're both fine to use. Okay. 
there's really not okay. a difference. Yeah. So uh, kind of, I think, following up with that, there were a lot of questions that were specifically about vector-based files and ECF versus PDF. Um, the, there was a question, uh, is there any good way to embed ECF to Word files? And I'm going to tag onto that, uh, like, short of just saving it as a PDF. I mean, I don't think that ECF can necessarily get into a, a Word file directly. Yeah, I don't believe they're compatible. I don't believe you can drag it in. And in fact, I actually encourage you not to, unless um, it's journal specified, I encourage you not to e even incorporate figures into your manuscript because when you incorporate any figure into your, in your manuscript, including a PDF, it's not going to be, once it's incorporated into a Word document, it's not going to technically be a PDF anymore. The, the compatibility program is going to um, turn it into a pixel-based image, most likely, and then you're going to lose, you're going to lose clarity and you're going to lose um, quality of the image. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I would say the majority 90% of journals, I feel comfortable saying, um, ask you to submit your figures separately in either TIFF or PDF or EPS format because journals know that this is something that happens. Mind you, they might have you initially submit your manuscript with the figures dragged in just because it's easier for the reviewers. However, you should always have the um, non-pixel you know, based image copy, you should always have the editable copy at hand because if you do accept it, more than likely that's going to be the copy that they're asking you for. Uh, right. Hopefully that answered the yeah. question. Sorry. I, yeah, I, I, think, I think that it gets down to it enough. Um, the, let's see, the next one, um, this should be pretty easy, is LZW compression software free? Um, as far as I know, you should be able to say, I, like I said, we do all of our formatting in Adobe Illustrator, and it's literally just an option in the pull-down menu. When you save a TIFF, there should be, I believe, in any program that allows you to save as a TIFF, there should be an option for either saving as LZW compressed TIFF. There's usually like a little checkbox, and if there is not an option, um, I have a feeling that it's because they will do it automatically, um, that they're not giving you an option to save it in the larger compression manner. That's something, um, if you have a specific program that you're, you're thinking of trying to save a TIFF as, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, you, I'm happy if you write, write that into me and tell me what program exactly you're looking to export as an LZW to compress TIFF and I can do the research and, and, and see if how they're saving their TIFF files. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know off the top of my head how to do it for every single program and, and yep. if they do it automatically, but I'm happy to look yep. into that. All right, great. I think that's, I think that's a fair answer. Um, the next, I'm going to combine two questions here. Um, Somebody asked, which free software would you recommend for beginners? And I think this is uh, alluding to the, the secondary software. And then also, can you recommend any tutorials or learning resources for making illustrative diagrams? Sure. Um, I am personally not very familiar, unfortunately, with the free software. So uh, I can't really, unfortunately, give you the best recommendation. However, I know that there's a lot that you can do even um, just within Excel itself. Um, and there's a lot more programs like Excel can do. Even programs like ChemDraw can do that, that people are unaware of. And honestly, um, maybe it'll sound funny, but the best way to do that is, is YouTube. I have found YouTube so extremely helpful. Um, even in, in my line of work, when I have questions, there's so many great tutorials on there. Um, I've learned so much just personally from videos on there um, about not only Illustrator, but Excel and, and ChemDraw and um, even R, you know. Um, so that would really be my suggestion. Um, 
because they really have great tutorial videos where they actually take you along, you know, step by step showing you how to do these things specifically and you can actually see somebody doing it instead of just reading a manual. That would be my best suggestion. It's a great suggestion. And uh, one of our attendees uh, recommends Inkscape uh, says that they switch to Linux from uh, using Windows with Illustrator and uh, it's apparently working very nice. So uh, as far as recommendations go, I think that's a good one. Um, the uh, next question is, uh, I need to add equations so often to my posters. Can you please suggest what software to use to make posters which can show a good quality equation? So, what you can try, I know, um, so we, I actually use Illustrator for everything, and Illustrator is, for me, a very simple way of adding equations, but again, I know it is an expensive program. What you can um, try to do a lot of times, there is a way to, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but there is a way to add equations in a Word document. And sometimes if you write your equation in the Word document and then resave that Word document as a PDF, you can then basically that it turns that equation into an editable vector file. And then you should be able to incorporate it into your poster. Um, without having the problems of, of pixelation or what, without having to worry about using a paid program such as Adobe Illustrator. That, that is something I would try. Um, if, you, if you, the person who asked the question, continue to have issues with that, uh, again, please feel free to email us at AJE and we can try to help you come up with a, another solution. Um, happy to do that. And uh, since, uh, since your screen did go down, I just want to repeat for everybody to make sure that I have it right. Uh, it's support at age.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and my, you can also, my personal email is um, Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y dot Smith, S-M-I-T-H, at researchsquare.com. Research Square is all lowercase with no spaces. Okay. Um, and I'm, if you prefer to, our support team is an excellent support team, but if you um, prefer to email me directly um, after the presentation, I, I'm happy to help the best that I can. Okay, um, so the next question I have is, uh, do you have any good resources for balanced color palettes? For balanced color palettes? Um, we do have, let me see if I can find, we do have a, uh, AJE does provide a lot of author resources um, on our website. One of them talking about color, which would be very helpful. Do you know that website? Um, I'm going to try to um, um, find that website so I can provide you with the link um, because I think that would be extremely helpful. It's, it's actually a whole video explaining the best uses of color and different color palettes. Um, uh, so I will try to do that. In the meantime, you can feel free to move on with questions and I'll try to find that. Yeah, uh, actually, the person says uh, they think they found it. Uh, it's, I'm actually going to share this with uh, everybody. Okay. Oh, uh, Thank you, everyone, for helping me out. I really appreciate it. But there's a lot, there's actually, for all of those you who do get that link, not only do our author service center have things um, for color, but they also have things regarding creating a manuscript, and we also have a video um, giving more points and tips in, post in poster creation as well. So basically an extension of my talk today can be found at the Author Research Center. Great. Um, and yeah, speaking of um, uh, further poster help, uh, uh, there's another question here that is, uh, how, do you, how do you determine the balance between uh, including very complicated data sets and wanting to simply communicate uh, your results? 
Yeah, so that I I see I understand. I used to do research with like very complicated data myself. The best thing I can tell you to do is if if there is a way like illustrative diagrams can be your friend. It's it's people do not have to see all the data that goes behind something. If you can um, create some sort of visual that kind of explains your final endpoint that you're trying to make after the analysis of all your complicated da data sets, that is what you want to go with, especially with the posters. Say, you know, save the complicated data sets for supplemental, you know, supplemental to your manuscript or say, you know, save that text for your manuscript. When, when you're trying to promote your research in poster format, it's not all necessarily all about the nitty gritty detail as much as it is about your overall findings and, and your important overall findings. That's what people want to know. And then it, it basically makes those people interested in engaging with you and asking you questions and, and maybe contacting you outside of the conference and maybe looking you up and looking for that, you know, your published manuscript. So I would avoid the, the complicated data sets and try to go for some overall illustrative diagram approach, even if it's just like a flow chart of your final findings. You know, you can very easily do that. We had n number of samples and we removed x number of samples and we ended up with this number and, and we ran this analysis and it yielded these results. You know, anything that you can simplify, especially for posters, the better. Leave the more complicated issues for your actual manuscript. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, the next question, uh, use, when you're using Excel for journal graphics, how can you get the best graphics for publication without cropping uh, and or using another software? So Excel, um, again, there I did uh, on one of my uh, panels where I actually talked about this, that I did include a really helpful link. It's uh, chemlab.truman.edu, and it goes on. But if you look at the handout, you'll see it. That is a really great website um, for actually describing this question exactly. But basically, it's just you can just actually play around with your graphs. If 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 you go up, um, if you click on your graph, a whole panel should open up uh, as a headline on in Excel, where it actually shows you a pull-down menu of several different graph types just for your same graph. You can actually physically go in and click on that background and just delete it. You can physically go in and click on the extra tick marks and delete them. Um, it's really hard. It's a kind of um, in-depth question to answer now. Um, but again, if you look at that website, it gives you a lot of of detail on how you can do this. Also, again, I would another thing I would go to YouTube for it is it is Excel is a great program, you know, um, and you can do a lot of things with it without having to bring. It is fortunately one of those programs where you can do a lot within it without having to bring it to a secondary program. So uh, the best I can say is, you know, just explore, explore, look at that link that I, I provided. Um, Check out some YouTube videos. There's a lot you can do. Yeah, and I'll compile all of these um, all of these links that are being shared, and I'll uh, do my best to get them into the uh, the message that goes out to all attendees. Uh, that'll go out with the recording uh, and, and and insert that in so that everybody has those three that we've talked about right now. Um, uh, I think that I had another question here I saw. Uh, oh, uh, the question is, and I'm um, not sure completely what the context is, but uh, does AJE charge for formatting? For fig yes, AJE charges for figure formatting. Um, we charge $70 per figure to format, and that's per figure. So it doesn't no matter how many panels are in that figure. Um, 
it's just per figure. So if there are, you know, two panels or five panels within that figure, it's still just $70 per figure. Um, we also do posters, um, which we charge $300 for formatting your poster. And then we also do custom illustrations. So if you um, want something, if you, let's say, have drawn, hand drawn a sketch of something and you want it digitized for um, use in your poster or as a figure in a publication, we will look at that sketch. Um, um, custom illustration is a quote based so service. So we'll look at your sketch. We'll quote you accordingly. If you accept the quote, we'll then continue to um, digitize that sketch for you. And you have unlimited um, iterations, basically meaning if you're not happy with the first drawing, we'll work with you back and forth until you're happy with the final custom illustration. Um, and we'll send it back to you. Um, you can also look at the AJE uh, uh, figure formatting and illustration service page for more details. Um, but yes, that is um, the general, our general services for illustration. Great. Um, well, I'm trying to see, I thought that I had one more, but I'm, I'm not seeing it right now. So uh, I think uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you for a great presentation. Uh, and thanks to everybody that, uh, that was here with us this afternoon. Um, if you guys are interested in more professional development webinars, we have another one next week. Uh, Dr. David Harwell is going to present Resumes 101, Building a Resume That Will Catch Their Eye. Uh, so that will be 2 p.m. next Thursday, and you can find the registration link at webinars.hu.org. Uh, did you have anything else that you needed to add, Ashley? No, I just thank you everyone so much for the great questions. Um, again, if I wasn't able to answer your question fully, please feel free to email AJ um, support or email me directly and I'll be happy to do so. And just thanks for listening. Great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here with us. Uh, everyone have a wonderful afternoon.